I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of the Tech Field Day event series. What you're about to see is a presentation with uh, Dell EMC and a panel of independent writers and speakers from around the world who focus on enterprise IT technology. If you'd like to see more about this, you can go to techfieldday.com. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like it, go to youtube.com slash techfieldday. Um, Smart Flash, you, know, you asked, like, uh, hey, what do we do in terms of kind of real time moving data up and down between different tiers? Um, one of the capabilities that we have is that regardless of the node type, well, just, we don't do this for NLs or HDs, but for, for the node types, imagine an X node. Uh, in, the, in those nodes is a combination of spinning disk and flash. And so that flash is usually used to home the metadata, and then the spinning disk is used for the data. So the metadata operations are really fast. Uh, listing a directory comes right out of flash, and the, direct, and the actual uh, data requests are pretty fast because it's distributed across a lot of spindles. Um, however, uh, what we've done is we've added the ability to provide read caching so that, and we actually read caching has always been there. So if you use the RAM memory that's inside of the uh, node, we have two sections of RAM, L1 and L2. L1 is a, more of a logical cache, if you will, and L2 is kind of like a physical cache where the blocks that are in that node are cached uh, into the L2 memory and then they're evicted out of that cache at some point. L1 is the logical cache for a file information. So as you read a file, it moves into the L1. Um, what we've also done is we said, okay, well, the L2 cache is now limited to the size of the memory when maybe that's 256 gigs in a node. Well, but you may have lots of SSD and flash in that particular node. Maybe it's multiple terabytes of flash. What if we, instead of evicting the, the L2 block information, back onto the drive, we actually evicted it into the flash cache. So what that means is that as I'm reading data out of that particular cluster, it moves into memory, into the high performance RAM, and then it's eventually evicted, but not onto spinning disk, but it's evicted into flash, so that subsequent reads of that data are very fast. They're at flash latencies. Make sense? So that, that gives us the high performance where you read the data, it gets cached, and then you reread it, it'll either come out of memory or it'll come out of flash. And at some point, it'll get evicted back to spinning disk, but that's at some point down the future. So that means the data's pretty cool at that point if you're not reading it fast enough. Every time you read it, it kind of gets moved up, bumped up in terms of how long it stays in the flash or in the, L, L, or in the uh, um, L2 and the RAM. So frequently reread data will stay there for a very so long time. performance you were talking about, you're able to see, I guess, what hits are coming from L1, L2, L3. That's right. And are you able to pin certain certain bits of data to the cache? Mm -hmm. um, sorry? Yeah, so yeah, you, could, you can pin data to cache. You can even actually, if you wanted to, you could create kind of a pool of, of flash right. that's actually used as a data pool as well. So you can do both if you wanted to. Uh, but there's, there's, there's strategies where you're going and pinning, there's strategies where you say, hey, you know what, I'm just gonna use some of the flash capacity in this node to go and create a, a pool, right. and that pool becomes now kind of a, a, a bucket that can be used for data, persistent data storage based on policy. You might always move, there. yes, it's just always there. That's right. It'd be interesting to understand as we go through this, um, <laughs> in, ter in terms of specific features, how many of them are included by default and how many of them are kind of like bolt-ons that customers need to oh, get? Oh, that's a good so question. What's, what's in the box? Yeah, so let me go back and just add that right away. Um, so first of all, on the rolling upgrade, um, all of the rolling upgrade capabilities are obviously included by default. Uh, uh, SMBV3 protocols are included by default. In fact, everything is included by default except in that first list where I showed you those features, those individual features. Those are all add-on features. So that includes, uh, in fact, I'll just, I'll just list them out right now. That includes um, sync IQ replication. That includes the Smart Connect load balancing, snapshots, um, the smart pools for moving data up and down, cloud pools, uh, quotas, and uh, deduplication. So those are the ones that we, we charge for. They come in bundles. So you could say you could get the advanced bundle or the enterprise bundle, which has a number of the different features that we see in commonly used in enterprise environments. So you might say, Okay, the enterprise bundle includes replication, it includes load balancing, it includes quotas, because that's what people tend to buy together. Um, our attach rates for the uh, specific features are very high. So a lot of people buy these nodes and then they buy those additional features. Now, the, the features are not uh, an incredible driver of cost. You know, they're, they're meant to be economic. 
Uh, we don't want to make it hard for you to actually go and buy the software features. And then today, when you buy a node, uh, you buy the node, it includes the operating system and the actual hardware. What you'll see us in the future is actually start to segregate the pricing so that you buy the hardware as kind of a at cost hardware. And then the operating system would be a software licensed uh, um, capability, including the, the add on features. Um, and the reason for that is quite simple is that, uh, uh, you know, we might move to things like a subscription model where people actually go and just buy at cost hardware and then they just lease the software over time is just, a, or basically turn it into a, a, a regular recurring OPEX uh, on top of a CAPEX. And just to clarify, that's a commercial conversation. That's not a technical conversation. The way that all of those things are built in, they're built into the product. And, and people can test this at home? There's a, you guys have got like a community edition. So the, the SD Edge that we talked about earlier, and I'll take you through that in a moment, um, has kind of two flavors. There's the free flavor and the paid for flavor. And the free flavor is limited in terms of capacity as compared to the take home flavor. Um, there's a couple of extra features in the paid, fa uh, paid flavor, uh, but you could go and download it today. So if you go to the Dell EMC site for Isilon, you can actually go and get SD Edge, install it on your VMware environment and run an Isilon cluster at home, no cost, knock yourself out. Um, so there you go. For the caching with the SSDs, is it mm -hmm. code shared with like fast cache? over on like the VNX line or is it completely built from the ground completely up? Completely built from the ground up because th this, these, this uh, caching is specific to this particular node. Um, and remember, if every node basically caches its own data. So parts of a file might reside on different parts of this. And, and this is nothing like okay. uh, VMAX, if you will, in terms of the way that we actually structure how data is allocated within this system. Um, it's just, it's brought up into our own L2 cache and then it's brought back down into the flash cache. Yeah, it's another question of these distributed systems uh, challenges that you kind of have to balance, right? If you think about what David talked about in terms of L1 cache, you think about L2 cache, <coughs> and you think about L3 cache, you have to realize where the network is, right? Um, as well as what the invalidation in a contention event across the cluster looks like. Right, so remember, you've got protocol conversations, let's call it NFS, coming into the top through the protocol head on the initiator side. Um, uh, um, uh, we terminate the NFS. You've got a logical level caching conversation that happens at L2. Think about it as, he talked about it as file aware. It's LBA of a file range. But by the way, it is within the context, and we're gonna separate arbitrarily the cluster here for a second. It's within the context of the local MBUF or the local buffering conversation of the protocol side. So it's inval it, it, it can be invalidated across a different node in the cluster. It's actually a really important point. We have strong POSIX compliant consistency across <clears throat> the entire cluster, which means that if you have opened a file on node A, and you have a pending write buffer because of an asynchronous activity or you have a pinned read buffer because you're busy reading something and he opens something up on a different node, um, uh, I have to make sure that, that the POSIX atomicity guarantees are provided in terms of if he's trying to read it, I need to flush your buffer. If, if you're trying to change it, I need to invalidate your read buffer. This guy will get shot down. He's also very valuable because this is where you're gonna do a whole bunch of file read ahead. If this guy's doing a ton of sequential traffic, this is, it's much more performant if I can just serve it directly out of local DRAM cache. Underneath that, right here, where I've drawn the node barrier, is where the, uh, uh, the backend fabric uh, conversation lives in our system. L2 is resident with the drives. It's not invalid in, invalidatable. Uh, because of uh, alternate traffic coming in on another node, which means that this is where the predominant amount of our DRAM cache actually sits, is L2 cache close to the drives. Um, now, the question is then, where is L3? And L3 is an eviction cache out of L2. It's actually an importantly chosen word because L2 has got a mix of data and uh, metadata blocks in it, right? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm looking up parts of my file system tree, I'm looking up the blocks uh, for the actual user I.O. As they age out of DRAM cache, they hit L3. 
L3 services kind of taking out the actual disk footprint in terms of IOs because he's servicing so much of the current working set directly out of L3, which is an SSD backed cache. Now, that means that the effective read cache size of the cluster scales according to the size of L3. And it's not duplicative and it's not <coughs> validated across the cluster depending on contended distributed traffic. So when you look at it, what it means is, is that you can take a look at a cluster and you can have, you know, many terabytes, right? Let's say it's very easy to envision 20, 30, 100 terabyte solutions out there that is the effective read cache size of your working set for both metadata and data for the cluster that also can survive uh, invalidation or concurrent access to those hot blocks across different parts of the cluster from a distributed systems context. Yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon to see five terabytes of uh, flash cache in a node. In a 144-node system, that's 700 terabytes of uh, flash cache. Basically, so a huge, huge global cache. Um, yeah, to John's points, this is not duplicated because the L2 cache is the actual block cache from the data that's only in that node. It's not from other nodes, whereas L1 presumably is across a number of different nodes. 